Assistance from the public remains critical in establishing a timeline of events which leads to swift conclusion through due diligence and strong investigative activity. I think we need to be patient. Um, I think everybody that saw that crime scene and the enormity of it knows that there is a lot of just drudgery work that needs to be done of the collection of cell phones, the examination of them, the collection of fragments of the bomb, um, uh, looking at backpacks, uh, interviewing witnesses. All of this is going to take time. The FBI and the state and local law enforcement agencies are working overtime to investigate the Boston Marathon explosions. They have about a 12-block stretch right now, right around the Boylston Street area that they are looking at. And in addition to the area around the finish line, they're also coming through witness videos, pictures, trying to put together these pieceless amounts of just so much evidence. So this morning, we've invited Peter Valentin, who was a retired trooper and lecturer in the Forensic Science Department at the University of New Haven, on the show. Peter, thanks for being with us. My pleasure. Now, after you see the video, you get over the horrible explosion, the shock of it. You think about the crime scene. It's a massive, massive area. What are investigators doing? They have so much to comb through. Well, I began hearing this morning that some items of evidence were now actually found on rooftops. And so that was something that I knew was eventually going to develop that not only do you have a crime scene that exists on the street, but because you have this explosion, you now have evidence being essentially thrown in three dimensions. So, so now you need to look at rooftops, you need to look at windowsills and ledges and other places where generally we don't anticipate finding evidence. Let's talk about the bombs themselves and what that might tell us as far as clues. They've been these pressure cookers they've been finding uh, filled with uh, ball bearings, BBs, nails, kind of a black powder, a gunpowder, if you will. Uh, what does that tell you? Well, the, the black powder, the, the ball bearings, all of those things are, are put in there to be shrapnel and to increase the capacity of this device to injure people. And so they're placed around the perimeter. And so when the explosion goes off, those items essentially ride the pressure wave and then impact victims and cause injuries. Um, that certainly gives us some intent that they're, you know, the focus of this was to particularly injure people, not simply to you know, make confusion or, or cause chaos. But you can buy these items anywhere. I mean, you can get a pressure cooker at any Sears, any Walmart. You can get nails, nails obviously, at a hardware anywhere. Store. And the black powder, I understand it, it's the same kind of powder that if you were reloading your own bullets, which many people do uh, who own guns to save some money, uh, you can just get that anywhere. Right. And one of the challenges is that many of these are going to be commonly available items. And so part of the investigation is going to be to look very carefully at each of the items that are recovered and to see whether or not there's anything unusual about them. Can we narrow them down to a particular lot or a store or a date of production? And that might be a way for investigators to go about deciding where or when or this item might have been purchased. And, and that would help. You were talking about the impact just a moment ago, and from the view we can see runners were thrown to the ground, glass windows shattered. What is, I guess, the, the scope of an impact as far as length, yards, things like that? Well, because there were no walls that were broken down, but windows, and I said people were knocked to the ground. Right, and the, the crime scene when you're dealing with an explosion is massive when compared to something you would ordinarily be dealing with. And so you have to consider what's called the blast radius. How far away from the seat of the explosion, right, where the explosion occurred, could the evidence have been thrown? And so you begin to calculate, well, how much material was there, and then how far away can I expect to find this material? And so you have to walk out all that distance. And now I'm sure it's being measured in thousands of feet and they're finding black canvas as part of the shrapnel, if you will, uh, indicating that these were probably placed in some kind of a black canvas bag. Can you get DNA off of any of these materials? Are, are there fingerprints available, or is that just a lost cause? Well, there is certainly a potential for that. And the interesting thing is I think lots of people think that because of the explosion, the components that comprise the device get consumed, or just, you know, that fire, that explosion, and that's not the case at all. The fire, if there is any, exists for a very short period of time, and many of the components essentially ride out that very high wave of pressure and find their way all over the place. So, you know, the fact that the, uh, the investigators are finding components that actually have physical evidence on them is not unusual. So there certainly is the potential of finding DNA or latent fingerprints, but it certainly depends on, on what type of condition that item is found in. You can imagine, remember the chaos we watched on TV two days ago, the heroic efforts of people coming in to rescue the injured. They're now moving items of evidence, handling them, 
And so that potentially has an, uh, an effect on whether or not we can get what we need as investigators from those items. Now, the FBI has been asking for videos, pictures, anything that you that was taken maybe in the moments before, right after the blast. So I have to imagine there's just dozens of investigators looking at all of these pictures and checking out the timestamp of them all, right? And even though a picture may, you may not think that it's important, talk about what investigators might pick out that could help them in this investigation. Well, it, it's an interesting aspect to this. So if there's a device that I believe, or there's an item that was shown in the photograph being near the sidewalk in the mailbox for one, where, the, where is the seat of one of the explosions. And so let's say that there's video of that and it shows a very fuzzy image of a particular person wearing a certain color you know, top and bottom. You can now use that information to scan all the other video that exists to see if you can get a clearer image of who might be wearing that color attire. And so there's hundreds of hours of video for sure, and it's going to take investigators a very long time to meticulously go through footage that might actually capture something useful four or five hours prior to the event. Mm. So it's a, it's a long process. What's your sense? Do you think they'll find whoever did this? I certainly think that there's good information to be had at the scene and that there's really no way to commit this type of crime without giving information about yourself and how you've gone about committing the crime. And it's a matter of being meticulous, diligent, about gathering all the information and deciphering it properly. What does it say? Who does it point to? Now, you have worked on a bombing investigation, right? Yes. Can you tell us briefly about that? Uh, well, it was, it, it, it was an explosion that actually occurred because somebody had placed a, a large canister in a very large fire. And so it wasn't something that uh, somebody built in terms of a bomb, but it had the same exact effect. You had a contained device that now is no longer capable of holding the pressure within it, and it explodes, and the shrapnel goes out, and that unfortunately killed somebody. Mm. Peter Valentin, good to talk to you. Peter, thanks for the insight. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Peter. At Farmers, we make you smarter about insurance.